what will things look like on the other side? So this new world, what, do, what does it look like? Is the U.S. still the reserve currency or has it lost that in the process of, of, of dealing with this? And then, and then what do we do to prepare? Uh, are there assets to buy? How do we brace for impact here? So I think what it looks like on the other side, parse depends on how long it takes. Um, my my base case is to see a more multipolar world. So you and you asked before, for example, what does this look like for other countries? Well, parse depends on how effective they are at at getting out of the problem. So to the extent that, for example, China can buy oil in its own currency allows them to escape some of the the downsides of U.S. fiscal dominance than if they were stuck buying oil in dollars while the U.S. is is running a fiscal dominance playbook. And so over time, I think you probably would see more kind of bilateral trade agreements between large foreign countries, um, other economic blocks. Um, But I don't expect, for example, any one of those currencies to become larger than the U.S. currency. Um, they, they're either, I mean, the only only economy at the same scale of the U.S. is China, and they've closed capital, uh, you know, kind of on their border. Um, and, and generally, they're not a super trusted kind of global partner. Um, and so it's not that one other big currency takes over, but you have a little bit more diversification of currency pricing or what kind of reserve assets um, central banks hold. So you get maybe less treasury purchases and more gold purchases because that's that's a market that they're used to. It's 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 pretty big. Um, you know, over time we'll see, for example, what happens to the size of the Bitcoin market in five or ten years or whatever else is happening here. Stable coins are an interesting variable because even as you have uh, top down countries are trying to de dollarize, you know. Um, at the bottom up, people generally still want dollars. Um, that, that's kind of their fiat currency go-to. And so stable coins are a way to basically get uh, dollars in the hands of people, even as their top level is trying to de-dollarize. So stable coins can actually extend the extent that the U.S. is able to maintain some degree of kind of globals or status. Uh, and pe- people can think that's good or bad, but it's just kind of a, a factor that, that potentially extends it uh, in the face of that kind of top-down de-dollarization. And so that that's all the kind of big moving parts there. But basically, it kind of shifts to a more, a more and more multipolar kind of reserve asset and, and bilateral trade agreement world. As far as what assets to own, generally, where possible, you, you short via currency, um, if you could, especially if you locked them in before rates went up, and then you own things that are scarcer. And then if you want to avoid tail risk, you diversify because, for example, you don't want to have everything in one asset and then your asset became the scapegoat that got like an 80 percent tax put on it for example right so it's not about Mm. maybe the asset itself does fine but maybe you in your jurisdiction don't do fine Mm. with that asset um and so you pay you either pay attention to what's happening in the in that area or you own you know for example you might own your own house you might then own bitcoin you might own a little bit of gold you might own some energy equities or you might own um, various equities that have locked in long duration rates and then they have variable pricing power and that could be in almost any industry and so you own kind of this 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 playbook that can get through things maybe if you're maybe if you want to have a if you're older and you want to have lower volatility you own things like t-bills or intermediate term tips rather than owning long duration bonds um, those are all kind of the different levers that someone can pull depending on where they live, what is their volatility tolerance like, what is their willingness to kind of concentrate and take on risk of that concentration, um, which could come politically as well. But basically, yeah, you want to own scarcer assets and, and be very careful about owning anything that's kind of just purely paper-based. I think uh, basically the bankless listenership is disproportionately long on, on cryptos mm-hmm. is one of those those scarcer assets. And interestingly enough- We Lynn, tend to not invest in paper. Yeah. <laughs> interestingly <laughs> enough, Lynn, I, I think you just presented the most compelling case I've heard to actually diversify out of crypto because like uh, my general impression is like crypto does quite well during this era of fiscal uh, dominance being a, a scarce, you know, uh, non-sovereign asset. But actually I had not considered that it could be scapegoated and it could be like subject to the 80% type of uh, taxes uh, that you're talking about. And I would not put it past the current uh, U- U.S. government regime to do something like that. So maybe there's a case for diversification. But just the, a final ending question, are we safe in crypto assets? And you know, I know you advocate a three-pillar approach and you know, you're know, you talking about profitable equities and, and honing, owning some cash equivalents and that sort of thing. But like, h- how, how do you think crypto fares in this whole fiscal dominance era? So I mean, I think that, for example, Bitcoin and stable coins are 
a big tool against this, right? So for example, even in, so in developing countries, the fact that people can like, you know, a, a Nigerian graphic designer could hold up a QR code on a video call or send me a payment string, an email or a DM and and have me pay her in, in whatever um, currency she wants, right? It goes around her local banking system, right? So that's a super powerful tool. That, that's one that's infinite value density through ports of entry. And that's um, infinite value density peer to peer Rather than through the centralized gateway, so that is that is you know basically the biggest tool uh, against this is basically you know uh, you know holding those assets, being able to transfer those assets is super important, which is also why you then do have to pay attention to jurisdictional risk. So I think that I mean that's why part part of my kind of case for being structurally long Bitcoin is this fiscal dominance environment, and then I do also pay attention to stable coins, especially in that kind of emerging world phenomenon, because everybody wants to go up the stack. Right, so if you're in in Turkey, you want dollars or gold or or, or Bitcoin or you know whatever the case may be. Um, if in the U.S. you you have dollars, so stable coins are less of an issue. Um, but what the, what these technologies do is they allow people more freedom of choice in whatever country they're in. They're able to go outside of their borders and and get assets or get monies um, that they can't get just purely internally. And so that that's uh, it's basically the biggest tool we have against basically a complete kind of replay of prior fiscal dominance periods or the effectiveness of capital controls. And it's I think it's worth defending. To continue leveling up your crypto game, then you need to get on the Bankless newsletter. It's the world's most popular crypto email and is completely free. Just click below to sign up.